Today on This Week in Space, we're joined by Professor Greg Autry to talk about the new space business. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 49, recorded on February 17th, 2023. The business of new space. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Make Your Fortune in New Space edition. (laughs) I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine. I'm joined by the ineffable Tarek Malik. How are you today, Dr. Malik? Um, Dr. Malik is my father, Rod, but I (laughs) I am doing uh, doing very well. I'm glad to be back. I had a a bit of a trip uh, last episode, but but I, I survived, and so now I'm here. Well, it's probably all we need to know about your drug habits today. Um, <laughs> ah, ah. And our guest today is the much fabled Dr. Greg Autry, who is, let me make sure I get this right, the clinical professor and director of the Thunderbird Initiative for Space Leadership Policy and Business, which is a much more dignified title than I got during my years of professoring. How are you, sir? Good. And we usually make it even longer by saying at Arizona State University. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Oh, I I'm have the, world, that in there. the world's longest title. Yeah. It's a good, uh, well, you know, longer titles mean bigger paychecks. So we're, we're down with that. Wait, can you write that down for me? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'll send letters. Um, and Greg and I have known each other a long time. He's been a good friend and uh, he's a good friend in the National Space Society. And he's done a lot of incredible stuff that you're going to hear about a little later but first i'm sorry to say we have a new space joke and this comes from listener derek inarelli hey Tarek. yes rod did you know that jupiter has 64 moons uh no no i did not know that maybe that's why they have such a bad werewolf problem <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> figured we deserve crickets for that one today all right hey derek that was a good well, one derek i like it i like it hey i'm just glad when they come in and, and greg i'm counting on you for for a couple from your students as always we invite you to join team Tarek and send us your best or worst space joke don't be shy and also please don't forget to do us a solid and make sure to like subscribe and do all that podcast stuff for us because we come to you every week for free so what do you expect all right let's move on to some headlines so we had an interesting week we had a rather conspicuous fireball that came down which is not particularly unusual in itself but what is unusual is that they actually found the rock that's right that's right yeah um on over the weekend uh you know ahead of our of our episode on february 12th there was this brilliant fireball over Europe. I mean, we, we saw reports uh, across France, across uh, uh, England, you know, people saw it in the night sky. I was actually kind of bummed because I was on a plane back from Amsterdam. So I missed it. You know, I missed I missed all the things. I did see the European Space Agency, but I did not see this fireball. And uh, while we were writing up the story of like all these great pictures and video, uh, some volunteers went out to um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but I think it's Rune, France. It's on the northern coast, and uh, and they they found a meteorite uh, there uh, as you know, just to go and check it. And you know, that's something that happens from these fireball events. Yeah, uh, people will go out to look for for the bits, uh, and it's you know, they're hard to spot. They they can blend in with the surroundings, and uh, the the meteorite that I saw was like the size of a fist. I mean, it's not a small thing that they mm-hmm. found, uh, but it's it's another just exciting thing to remember that we're part of this vast solar system that has lots of objects in it and nasa has said that february is which is the month that we're recording this is fireball season uh, for these mm-hmm. meteorites that, that these meteors that actually burn up and and explode and uh, uh and then rain these meteorites down so good stuff there i saw one years ago which actually went almost from horizon to horizon and exploded about two, two thirds of the way through and turned a whole bunch of colors that that's that's my high water mark yeah haven't had another yeah. one like that since the 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 student who found this his name is uh 
Louis LeBlanc, he's just 18 years old, who joined like a Sky Lookout uh, group that that went out to go look for the the remains of this. And the really interesting thing about this this one too wasn't just that they found the meteorite, but they found the actual uh, meteoroid, the asteroid, mm. like less than a day before they realized it was going to hit the the planet. And then it, you know, it was small, but it, it hit and it, it made this fireball and they were able to find it. And the astronomer that found it in Hungary, uh, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong too, and I apologize, Christian Sarnizek, Sar, 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 it, it's a... Just go through the concept. Christian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's the second time. Second time they found uh, they, they they found a, a an asteroid a, a day before uh, it it hit the the planet. So uh, big kudos. This was this is from our writer at space dot com. I, I forgot to mention that at the start, yeah. but uh, but uh, many other folks did pick it up because the images are just amazing of this this uh, fireball. So here's the important question: Did Lewis get to keep his meteorite, or <laughs> yeah. does the French government claim uh, authority over everything in the solar system? So you know that's a really good question. In fact, I didn't uh, I didn't check in on that, but I'm pretty sure they're they're going to hand it over to some uh, uh, scientific institution at least for the uh, for the interim. But I do hope that the town that where they found it gets it in the end and puts it on display. Well, that's an interesting point, Greg, because I was talking to when I was up in the Arctic over the summer. I spent a month up there and I was talking to our camp manager who goes to the Antarctic on all the opposing seasons and leads the meteorite hunts there. And I said, Bureau brought one home. He said, oh, no, they all belong to the National Science Foundation. I said, well, I know, but, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Surely, surely you put it. He said, not. So they got to obey the rules. So of the thousands they found in the Antarctic, because, of course, in the Antarctic, it's all white ice and snow, and if you see something black, it's either a meteorite or a little dog poop. And if it's a meteorite, you go and collect it, and I guess you give it to the NSF. So that's – that's um, Now, is that because the NSF funded his trip, or does it yeah. have something to do with it being in the U.S. Uh, zone in Antarctica? Right. Possibly both, but it's because the NSF funds this every year. So he's done, I think, 33 seasons down there, and that's how long they've been looking for meteorites. It's pretty impressive. All right, moving along. Uh, as we speak, I believe there's a Boeing press conference going on talking about Starliner, which we're hoping to see fly this year. And um, Tark, you, yeah. you were there, and I yeah. know you're going to cover it for space.com. So what do you know? Yeah, this actually comes directly from NASA because we haven't even written our story yet. <laughs> it just happened yeah. uh, earlier earlier today. But just before lunch, NASA had a, a press conference with Boeing that they announced literally less than 24 hours before and so it's like, oh, well, if they're going to have this last minute teleconference, they, they must be announcing something. And, uh, and NASA had said that it was like the two month out mark from the actual launch. We've already known that Starliner's first crewed flight test was going to launch in sometime in April. NASA has said mid-April, maybe late April. And so getting that rollout and that announcement, you know, suggests that they're going to actually make a make some news, but they did start out. And the first thing NASA said today was not to expect any big announcements. This was really just a status update. NASA saying that they and Boeing are 80% complete on the certification paperwork that they need to say that Starliner itself is, you know, ready to carry astronauts, um, with, uh, I believe it's uh, uh, NASA astronauts, uh, uh, Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore, uh, who are, are to uh, fly on on this mission to the International Space Station. They're not there yet. Uh, they're kind of reserving uh, a few more weeks of uh, time to decide if Starliner is, in fact, ready to carry people. Uh, and around early to mid-March, they're going to make a final decision on if they're going to load uh, fuel into a propellant into the, the the capsule itself that it needs to launch and they've got a 60 day clock that starts once they do that and this is kind of their their rationale is that they saw some corrosion and valves that really led to a bunch of delays for the the, the uncrewed flight test uh they want to avoid that by by having this kind of uh this clock in which they're going to have to fly so they, they don't want to start that clock unless they're really serious and ready uh to put astronauts aboard meanwhile oh go ahead I was just going to say, Greg, you're kind of at the nexus of hearing a lot of things from a lot of people. You got any uh, got any inside info for us? Uh, a little bird did tell me a couple of weeks ago that we were looking at April 12th or 12th or 13th. Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I'm excited about that. Uh, I think it's really great that we're going to have a uh, competitive launch market and technical redundancy. So we're going to be able to get people back from uh, from station uh, without uh, a trampoline if uh, if there should be any complications <laughs> with the SpaceX system. 
Well, and and golly, isn't it ironic that the people that propose the trampoline are the ones that have all their leaky capsules up there? But that's another story. <laughs> all right. Um, finally, shooting down the aliens. More balloons, more shoot downs. Or are they <laughs> balloons? So we've had a spate of what appear to be observation or reconnaissance or spy balloons, at least some of them, coming over the U.S. and Canada. And we've reacted militarily. Uh, and apparently part of what's happening, at least from what I've read, and some of this is on space.com, some of it was other sites, but you can find it at space.com, is that, uh, and this is the first NORAD shoot down, I believe, since they were founded. And part of the conversation is around adjusting the sensitivity of their instrumentation because apparently for many decades it's been tuned to the point that it doesn't see little things like weather balloons because there's 1600 of them reportedly launched every day around the world so there's a lot of them floating around out there and of course part of the conversation not on space.com has strayed to are they really weather balloons and i'll be talking about this at alien con in a few weeks <laughs> i'm sure it's going to come up and my response is you know if aliens are equipped to come a hundred light years to earth, let's say, and they manage to get shot down by an air breathing jet and a skyrocket, uh, then they're not doing very well. So I kind of have my doubts, but open, open to opinions. <laughs> gentlemen. Well, I mean, the, I think the thing that I would, I would want to mention is that, so we've had four kind of events. We had the Chinese spy balloon, uh, that very well, well, well documented. Then, uh, just in the last week, we had three other events over Canada, over Alaska, uh, over Lake uh, uh, Huron as well, that the, uh, the the military got involved in and shot some stuff down. There's been some reports that at least one of them was like a tiny little science balloon. And in fact, uh, uh, just this week, the president himself went on, uh, had a, a whole press conference where he was saying, hey, you know, we have to, we have to get some, some new rules and regulations in place for how we're going to you know, detect and, and shoot these things down because some of them he said were, were private uh, or, or commercial or even hobbyist events. Right. There was at least one that looks like a glorified Mylar balloon that you'd get at Party City that was like a hobbyist group, you know, right. <laughs> the one in Alaska where they, they it's, 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 it's not like official yet, but they say that they lost their contact with their thing as soon as the, 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 the shoot down was reported. So, you know, there, it, it's, it's interesting uh, to see the president saying that and that the white house spokesperson also said the day earlier that there wasn't any sign of a actual ufo like aliens themselves uh but you see ufos in all the headlines now so i guess we're just going to use that uh rod for anything and and not not for actual little green men uh and women like zipping around uh, well it's been <laughs> the, the convenient conference. for certain radio shows and magazines for years greg you got any thoughts on this um, yeah, actually, a few years ago, I launched a high altitude uh, weather balloon with a VR camera rig and a skateboard on it uh, and made a, a cool VR uh, video you can see. Uh, check uh, skating to space uh, at one, <laughs> 121 C boards. Um, uh, and we wanted to demonstrate how cool this carbon fiber skateboard was. Uh, it was a lot of fun to do. It wasn't hard. FAA uh, gives you an approval pretty easily to do these things. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, again, like uh, Tarek mentioned, nobody was looking for them. Now you go looking for them, you're going to find them, right? So uh, I don't doubt the Chinese uh, were doing nefarious stuff with their balloons, but I'm sure the rest of them are are just hobbyists and uh, and and commercial operators. We should do one, Rod. We should make a UFO. And, I've done and, it and already. You, <laughs> Didn't I tell that story on the podcast earlier? I was working at a commercial production company, and we ended up a shoot one day with a full four-foot-tall tank of helium. And I hey, got out the video. my <laughs> friends, yeah, with a bunch of uh, Glad the trash fit. bags, the big 12-gallon ones. We filled them up and built this thing, and I got a piece of foam core and cut this disc with colored gels in it and little fins so it would rotate, and it was lit, and we set it up at night. And we're uh, a little admonished when it went and drifted over Ventura Boulevard in Los Angeles. <laughs> and so just out of curiosity, I called Griffith Observatory, where I had worked up till a few years prior to that, see if they had gotten any reports. And by golly, their switchboard had lit up. So, yes, we're I gonna, was responsible for at least one UFO. We're going to. Did you get FAA clearance on that, Rod, before you did it? You know the answer. <laughs> this is me we're talking to here. Come on, Greg. You know me better than that. Uh, by so the way, I, saw, I, I saw our video was up there, by the way, and it's it's narrated by uh, astronaut Mike Lopez Alegria, who uh, mm. uh, led the uh, the cool Axiom flight a little while ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Every, we'll, we'll have to include the link to that, that skating to space video because it is cool. You look down and you just see the skateboard and like the Earth is like 
far below. That's awesome. That's awesome. It looks like Mars because it's Mojave, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg's done a bunch of cool stuff. So speaking of cool stuff that Greg has done, let's talk about you, Greg. Um, I think it would be uh, appropriate to start this off with just learning a bit about what your program is and what it does. I've, I've spoken there once. It looked like a great it's, it's the kind of program where if you have a chance to talk to the folks and get to know them a little bit and talk to Greg and see what he does, you want to sign up and go. At least they have to start signing checks. So uh, tell us a little bit about it, because it looks like a really great program. Sure. All right. Well, thanks for giving me a softball plug here. Um, <laughs> it's I, had all, I had always wanted to, to do a uh, commercial space uh, degree program, and I tried to convince uh, USC to do it for the seven years I was there. I couldn't couldn't make it happen. I couldn't even get them to give me a class. But uh, mm. luckily, being nominated to be chief financial officer at NASA uh, brings attention. And I had several <laughs> schools come to me and say, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a uh, uh, basically a space MBA, a, a management degree program in space? And and I wanted to do that. So I, I spoke to several schools, uh, ones I won't mention, but they're really good. Um, <laughs> ASU, though, had this broad uh, space uh, initiative from the president's office on down. So they've hired top engineers and scientists, people like uh, Lindy Elkintanton, who's the PI on the upcoming Psyche launch, Jim Bell, mm -hmm. who runs all the cameras on Mars, basically. Uh, we've got the uh, PI for the sample return, but they also hired space lawyers, even people in the creative writing industry and, and myself, right, to, to run this business program. So uh, we're basically giving you a executive global masters in management which is a degree thunderbird has been offering uh for many years part of a, a prestigious history of basically being the world's first international business school uh but with a space leadership business and policy emphasis and that means that you get finance you get strategy you get accounting and marketing and all the things you'd normally get in a management degree but you get them in the space context and very often from space experts Myself, my colleague Zahir Ali, who uh, helped run the SOFIA program for NASA for many years uh, and is deeply embedded in the space community. We've got Kevin O'Connell teaching the policy class. He was the director of the Office of Space Commerce for several years. We have Steve Shen uh, teaching the finance class. He's the deputy CFO at NASA, and he was the acting CFO when I was the nominee. So you get an incredible group of people. You get guest speakers. We've had Charlie Bolden. Scott Pace, uh, Tori Bruno, um, and just a, a plethora of really interesting people from civil, military, and commercial space. Well, and, and most you, important, you, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. The thing that's most important to me is who's in the classroom. Right. And what we want to do is bring together this, this diversity of people in the space community, not have a, a homogenous classroom. And by that, I mean, you've got 20 something startup founders, You've got a venture capitalist. We've got investment banker. We had uh, a captain in the Space Force, a retired Air Force colonel, and a brigadier general in uh, the Air Force Reserves. Uh, NASA engineer, all working together on projects that kind of simulate what happens in the real world. Uh, because normally these people get educated in isolation. The military people go through their academies and their own graduate schools. Finance people go to these Ivy League schools. Policy people go to GW or Kennedy. And then they come together and clash on the hill in the real world, right? Uh, and it's it's great to put them together on a project. So uh, I'm passionate about it. I love it. Cohort two will start in September. There is still time to apply. Uh, Thunderbird.asu.edu or reach out to me. And Tarek, did you catch the part about hiring creative writers where we were completely <laughs> overlooked? Or perhaps it, it went into our spam folders. I, that's what I'm going to assume. Um, and Greg kind of uh, buried it in there a bit, but you were up for consideration to be the NASA CFO for a while. And that was a lot of fun, from what I recall. <laughs> yeah, it's great to see the sausage made. I mean... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> I, I knew about it sometime in probably February, March of, of 2020. And then there's a long background process before they want to say anything. Uh, so the FBI has got to do everything the FBI does, which is like a security clearance plus, you know, it's it's yeah. an IRS audit, a colonoscopy. Uh, they go they go scare all your neighbors. Right. So two guys in suits during COVID lockdown. Right. Go knock on the doors of all your neighbors and say, 
do you know this family down the street? Do you have any reason to believe they're a threat to the United <laughs> States government? <laughs> so that's interesting in itself. Uh, then you got to work with uh, the senators on the committee and their, their staff uh, in a bipartisan way, which was really informative. And I'm happy to say they were actually uh, supportive. Uh, there weren't going to be any issues with my nomination, and I was expecting to be unanimously consented in. Uh, in September, when uh, the Senate came back from their uh, their August recess, so I quit my job uh, at USC in August uh, to focus on this full time because I didn't want to leave my students hanging. And then, as you may know, uh, stuff hit the fan in the fall of, of 2020 and uh, U.S. politics became kind of dysfunctional. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, unfortunately, passed and that moved my hearing date later in the year past the election. And after that, uh, uh, it was anybody's guess if there was ever going to be a vote. And so I am happy to say I was I was not uh, not rejected by the Senate, but Mitch McConnell never scheduled a vote on my hmm. uh, my nomination. Well, it's interesting that that can even be a thing, that it just didn't get scheduled. That, that Yeah, I had no, I no idea when I started the process uh, how much fun it would be. But uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I spent every day between like November 8th and January 2nd when the Senate goes out of session calling senators and their staff saying, please bring my nomination to the floor because all somebody had to do was walk up and bring it. But, you know, uh, they wanted to push through judges because judges last forever. Uh, and I understand that process, but that said, uh, I spent a lot of time working with the great people at NASA headquarters uh, and uh, elsewhere, uh, digging deeply into uh, every NASA program and understanding it thoroughly so that I'd be prepared uh, to do that, looking at the finances. And as you may know, I was on the agency review team a few years before that, where I did the same thing. So I got right. in intimate knowledge of everything NASA does, and that that's exciting. You, know, you mentioned um, when you were describing the program uh, at, at ASU, uh, just kind of like the like a snapshot of the environment that we all kind of find ourselves in. Whereas, you know, about you know, 20 years ago when I, when I first kind of dipped my toe into the space reporting, there was like some agencies, you had Boeing and Lockheed, you know, and, and that was pretty much it uh, when it came to uh, opportunities for like students now or, or people looking for careers in, um, in like the aerospace you know, field. And, and I'm, I'm curious what you see now, like compared to that era, that kind of the era yeah, of the aerospace giants, like now what, what you tell your students about what the opportunity is now for what they, what they, what they are looking to, to achieve. When I grew up uh, in the 1970s, uh, I assumed I was going to go into the space industry somehow, you know, of course I wanted to be an astronaut, but I just assumed I'd be in space. Uh, but one of the problems with that military industrial complex system is there's only one customer. And when the budgets got trimmed, uh, you know, for, for NASA uh, post Apollo, there weren't a lot of jobs there. Uh, and people had those jobs, wanted to keep them. So a lot of us graduated out in the eighties and, and the idea of starting your own space startup was not really a thing. I think Bob Truex was somewhere in Sacramento collecting rocket parts in his backyard and trying this. But for most of us, <laughs> that, was, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so we all went into software. And, you know, I think you if if you would have had a diversity of employment opportunities, probably Jeff Bezos, I and Elon Musk all would have gone directly into aerospace and the world wouldn't be as exciting, maybe. Uh, but fast forward. Yeah, you're right. Even up until. 10, 15 years ago, you went to work for the big traditional players. Many of them are great companies and amazing careers there. But there wasn't this, this amazing boiling pot of, of new ideas and supply chain and tangential companies to the space industry. Because it's not just about SpaceX and Blue Origin or Rocket Lab. There's all these companies that are supplying them out there now and building things to go on these cheaper launch systems uh, that you couldn't do, you know, back when a launch cost you $400 million or what have you. So it's an exciting time to be in the industry. Uh, I am excited that young people are entering and even more importantly, people who like me went into software or finance or something else are coming into the space industry now as second careers uh, because we need them. Uh, there's no way we can grow uh, this industry fast enough from within. So that, that brings me to uh, a question, which is how, I mean, you've invented something unique here with this program, I think. <laughs> how do you go about deciding how to train young and not so young people to prosper in this field? And in, in what areas do you, do you tend to suggest they focus? 
Wow, uh, that is an excellent question. You know, the, the biggest thing we provide them, even more than the education, is, is again, that network. Um, mm -hmm. We connect them deeply into the space industry. I mean, when I say we had, you know, Charlie Bolden and Scott Pace, for instance, we had them at the same time uh, in the classroom with 20 students. You know, where does that happen, right? Um, that that's an amazing network you get to build and by listening to other people outside they find opportunities i didn't even know existed my cohort one is already uh communicating daily with my cohort two uh, on our whatsapp channel and, and they're sharing job opportunities and talking about startups together and working on uh events like um the the space regulatory boot camp that's coming up in new mexico bryce kennedy one of my students is helping launch that so uh i almost operate more as a resource than uh, uh, than a dictator in this. I'm not telling them where to go. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like how can I help you find your way to where you want to go? Uh, but what do I recommend? I recommend don't start a new launch company. I really right. do that. <laughs> <laughs> how many do you expect to see fail over the next two years? A, a lot, but it's going to be great because if you're a satellite company, they're going to be trying to give away launches in the next few years. And uh, mm. it's just going to be a good time to uh, to be in the application space. Uh, but the data, that's more interesting uh, because all these satellites are going to be generating vast amounts of data. Uh, think about when you've got global communications to places that didn't used to have good communications like Oceania. Uh, what will that mean, right? What can you do there that you couldn't do before? What can fishing fleets do differently? I don't know. Mm -hmm. How can you help protect the Galapagos Island from predation uh, uh, by using this new uh, imaging, communications monitoring, and communications technologies? So many cool I new ideas. You, you mentioned uh, about like in the future, launches might even just they're going to be a lot more affordable uh and that with these companies giving away flights perhaps you know they're probably not going to give it away for peanuts right but something like that for for a new satellite Compared to peanuts, I mean, we're already seeing pricing below five thousand dollars a kilogram and you really? know rod and, I, rod and i are old enough to remember when that was eighty thousand dollars a kilogram right so it is peanuts uh, i mean high school students could obviously afford to not only build a cube set but uh if they're not too picky about where and when they go they can launch it <laughs> this is a crazy new world yeah so so um uh i, I don't want to belabor it too much but i mean it, it, there must be a limit to how many launch vehicles like a an industry can support how many you know satellite buses uh, you know, the, of different sizes that these vehicles can support, uh, you know, over time. Are we at that limit? Are we nearing it? Or are we just kind of like at the oh, very top beyond, of that? We're way beyond the limit. So what you see, and I study this, uh, the emergence of new industries is is my area of academic research. Anytime there's a new industry, you look at the aviation industry, there's a thousand crazy designs that don't make sense uh, that go out there and a thousand companies start up or car companies, and then they all roll in. And in almost any mature industry, you end up with between two and five uh, big players dominating the whole industry. Uh, and that's how it will be someday. Now, I don't think it'll be that way for 10 years or so. But yeah, you're going to see these companies fail, be rolled up. It's okay if they fail. Uh, it doesn't mean that the technologies they developed went away, the, the human resources they trained and uh, gave experience to, they don't go away. They just go to another company. I mean, like how many e-commerce companies we're trying to start up in the late nineties and now we only have one, I think. <laughs> well, and, and Hey, NFTs, look at what happened there. Yeah, talk about that. Um, yeah. So, NFTs go with your UFOs. I mean. yeah, yes, they do. <laughs> and light, wisely. So uh, you, you talked a little bit about this and um, you, you and I are old enough to remember how things have changed. So when we were young, you know, more when I was young than you, but when we were young, it was NASA and prime contractors and cost plus contracts. And that was the mm -hmm. classic way things were done. That got us to the moon. That got the shuttle built. Uh, it flew out over 30 years and good stuff. Now we're in a new realm of how NASA operates. And uh, I think you're in a unique position to prognosticate a bit about how these new arrangements with NASA, uh, you know, essentially buying services and hopefully continuing to push you know, the, the sort of things that private industry can't or generally won't do, but NASA can, the daring stuff. Uh, how do you see that that relationship maturing? Yeah, you know, there's both really great things here and some things that are immensely frustrating with where NASA is going. Uh, so NASA, in my opinion, deserves kudos for, first of all, uh, you know, way back during the 
GW Bush administration getting COTS going, right? Um, and uh, folks that I've worked with like Chris Shank deserve some some credit there for, for pushing that along. Uh, that was an actual commercial competitive program. Uh, the Obama team deserves incredible credit for commercial crew, Lord Garver, you know, in, in, in particular for making that happen. Uh, our team, uh, you know, when I joined the Trump transition team, we wanted to continue that little bit of back and forth with different personalities in the team who felt differently about traditional systems and commercial systems, but we work that out and we get both, right? So I feel good about the idea, like you said, that NASA should be pushing the envelope, going to the moon and beyond. Uh, it's clear that low earth orbit can be pretty well managed by commercial rocket system satellite builders. We don't really need a NASA, you know, testing anything new there. They can uh, certainly, uh, uh, contract for services, and I'm glad they're doing Earth observation and other things, but the data is going to come from, from commercial companies directly to scientists, engineers, and, and commercial operators, and we don't need an exploration agency in the way. <clears throat> what I'm concerned about, though, Ron, yeah. is that, you know, the, uh, the risk-taking, right? Um, every time, you know, we would talk about pushing further or faster, you'd, you'd get somebody at headquarters saying, oh, you don't understand the scar tissue, right? And I do, I do, people died, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But that was always the expectation. Uh, that's why they, you know, you look at the right stuff, they went and got test pilots, right? Because when they started the Mercury program, test pilots were dropping at like 5% per year, if you go, you know, uh, read the book, um, that's amazing. And so nobody ever expected exploration space to be safe. I'm hoping space tourism ends up being a very safe activity and eventually point to point space transportation ends up being safe. But we don't expect NASA to be ultra safe. They should do everything they possibly can to keep their system safe, but they should not be uh, obsessed to the point that they move slowly. Their job is to move quickly. So that's an issue that, that concerns me and a lot of people. Well, and we've, and then, we've seen that, right, uh, Greg, we've seen that with SLS 18 years to get to get that thing off the ground. Yeah. Because, yeah. And you know, that's why I started a management degree program. If you look, it's not just SLS, let's be fair, JWST. As yeah. soon as I sat down with the NASA uh, uh, agency review team and I started looking through the financials, which was kind of my job on the team, I'm like, oh my God, NASA's discovered a black hole, but it's in the budget and it's called, <laughs> oh, no. it's called the James Webb Space Telescope, right? Oh man. <laughs> well oh, done, <laughs> got a boom. Yeah, everybody loves it, but it was supposed to, in 2003, when it was first brought forward, be an $800 million project. Yeah. It was an $8 billion project by the time I got to it in 20, 2016, well on its way to $10 billion, right? Mm -hmm. That's insane. Order magnitude. And it wasn't the technology. I mean, technology is challenging, you know. And same thing with SLS. There's almost no new technology in SLS. It was supposed to save money, Tarek, because we were going to reuse <laughs> old shuttle parts, right? And so the engine. And who are, thought that I'm, was a good idea yeah. even then? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I didn't. I think that the uh, 68s would have been better than the RS 25s. But anyway, uh, it's the management that was uh, was often the issue there that uh, kept these programs uh, slow and, and and over budget. And very often, engineers and scientists get pushed up into being in charge of multi hundred million dollar projects, and they have no education in accounting, finance, leadership, or these things. So we've got a degree for that. Uh, but the, the last thing that concerns me at NASA is the government in general has changed a lot since Apollo. And it's not NASA's fault, but there are all these rules to make things, you know, uh, honest and, uh, and transparent that didn't exist back then. And every time you turned around when I was at headquarters, people were just worried about what you put in an email or on paper because that could be FOIA. And then somebody would pull it out of context and put it in the news and misinterpret it, and make the agency look bad or make Congressman X or Senator Y angry or look bad. And, and you know, it's hard to get things done when you're in that sort of environment. And the budget management, uh, the NASA administrator literally can't move more than about $500,000 from one pot to another without a literal act of Congress. You can't buy a condo rod, you know, in DC for $500,000. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. I won't say who, but uh, I was with a former NASA administrator uh, a few months ago in a small, small conference. And he said, if I had tried to run NASA the way that James Webb did, I would have gone to jail, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and James Webb could just throw money around and get things done. And honestly, there was probably a lot of corruption going on during the Apollo days, but we got the mission done because our focus wasn't on spending all our time nickel and diming the system it was get the job done.
the last NASA field center I worked at, uh, I remember sitting in an office with the guy I was working for, who was a senior administrator of, of that division, not of the whole of the whole field center. But the only books in his office were these enormous binders of rules. And when we would discuss something, because he didn't like looking up at the computer, he'd pull pulled out his binder and start flipping through it. And he realized <laughs> every section of every page is because somebody did something once that somebody else didn't like, and they had to write a rule around it. And they are just so multi -layered. It's amazing they get anything done. But I want to talk about something different. You mentioned the Trump administration. I saw a few years ago something that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime, which was a presidential transition, fraught as it was, where the NASA priorities weren't shifted yes. much and the money didn't disappear for SLS and the lunar landing program didn't get killed and Space Force didn't get disbanded and sent out into the weeds. It was jaw dropping because I had never seen that before. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I was amazed too, as, as were uh, the other members of my team. I can tell you when we sat around the table and said, here's the things we want to propose to uh, Vice President Pence, uh, you know, because the pre Vice President's normally in charge of space. Uh, we wanted to find things that would be continued uh, beyond what we presumed would be that administration's eight years. But if it wasn't going to be eight or it's going to be four, you wanted to make sure that these were things that were palatable, right? Um, and that, that hasn't happened in a long time. So I've got to give huge credit to the Biden team for having the good sense to to continue. And it wasn't just within NASA. It wasn't just the Artemis and, and Space Launch System and commercial crew. Um, you know, and of course, we continued commercial crew from from the Obama team. Um, it was Space Force. It was the National Space Council and a lot of other, uh, you know, bigger plays. Uh, the decision to use the Office of Space Commerce with more budget uh, and and address space traffic management and space situational awareness issues uh, that uh, was done. And the Biden team has increased the budget for that office to something real for the first time. Mm. Uh, in 2016, it was eight hundred thousand dollars. By the way, uh, and uh, <laughs> oh my, yeah. And there were three people. Somebody suggested to me you should take the job of director of the Office of Space Commerce. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? Yeah. <laughs> I have to uh, eat. But, okay. Yeah, Kevin O'Connell, bless his heart, you know, made it made it real, and and he got the backing he needed, and now we have a budget that has grown just like the James Webb Space Telescope, but for good. <laughs> you know the 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 layers of opportunities for new new aerospace professionals coming in seems much more diverse than it was when you know when when the shuttle program was in its, its heyday and, and and you're we're talking about the you know the, the the department of commerce now and that people are looking at space there or with faa right uh, which uh, you know has is is doling out new rules now in addition to astronaut wings and, and and whatnot and it reminded me of a conversation i had with my, my daughter she's 14 the other day about she, she's asking like you know, how to get into i think a video game industry about what what the different jobs are and and i was telling her that there isn't just like the people that do the code for the game. There's the people that do the music mm -hmm. for the game and the art for the game and, and the people that pay those people, um, you know, and get the accounting done for, 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 for those types of things. And I'm curious if there's anything new that you've seen, just if, if it's in setting up the course here uh, for your own students or in watching the evolution of this shift from kind of government uh, uh, focused agency focused uh, aerospace development to a, a more commercial private uh, uh public partnership that has sprung up, you know, to fill in some of those gaps that uh, that's maybe some of the more the more government, uh, you know, the, 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 the big environment would have just absorbed it over time. Yeah, you know, I, I want to surprise you, though, by telling you something you probably don't know, which was I started in the video game industry, right? <laughs> so I made this product called on. I knew that. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, back back in the day when uh, he, when I was, he was in holding high school, up for for our li listeners, he was holding up a Pac Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pac Man Pac -Man for box. the Apple two, Apple Two, um, <laughs> home version. So um, back in the day when I started video game company in high school, yeah, we did the art. I mean, I drew on graph paper little square boxes and then I cutted them into uh, hexadecimal and typed them into the computer to make the shape. <laughs> I did the marketing. I did the accounting. Right. Uh, but no, now now it's 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 a team of thousands to make a game, which is you know why I'm not not in that business anymore. Um, 
But it was really interesting to watch that industry mature. In this case, the industry's kind of devolved because a few years ago, if you went to go work for, you know, one of the big companies, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, um, you know, you came in at the bottom and you put in your dues for gosh knows how many years working your way slowly up until you were a gray beard and then you could have a management position. Uh, and now it's been disrupted. People go directly into higher levels of the business based on, you know, either their ambitions and capabilities or, or, you know, good fortune, but it's a lot more opportunity to, to move. You do not have to put in 40 or 50 years to make a difference. I see a lot of, and that's how it was in Apollo. Honestly, the average age at NASA during Apollo was, I think 28 or something crazy like huh. that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, before the graybeards who have fear of the scar tissue all took over everything. Um, and, that's happening again in the commercial sector. So a lot of opportunities, uh, Tariq, and like you mentioned, it's not just about being a, a rocket scientist. Uh, you need marketing people. Unfortunately, you need lawyers. Um, you need uh, uh, people to do the uh, uh, the creative writing for the uh, 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 company. You need video producers. Uh, uh, you need software engineers and electrical engineers and and hr people and all that stuff that would be in any company but a lot more fun yeah, there's hope for us yet rod he there's hope for us yet. writing again yeah. i know <laughs> so i i by the way greg i i was interviewing gene kranz years ago and i asked him at one point it was a great interview what a what a classic gentleman he is and i said you know you filled mission control with guys who were 26 on average some of them, like John Aaron, when he made the call on Apollo 13, I think it was 23. I mean, it's unbelievable when you think of it from a perspective of today, unless you're talking about private industry. And I said, what what caused you to do that? And he looked at me with those steely missile man eyes of his and says, I wanted men who didn't know failure. And I thought, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I have a, a, a question along different lines. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of talk about internationalism in space today. The Artemis Accords are one step towards doing that. We've done it for years on the space station. But, you know, results mostly good. Um, some some issues with Russia, but it's it's worked out surprisingly well. But we've got one big competitor staring us down these days who makes no bones. If you read the the white papers about China's space program, they make no bones about, you know, it's a very nationalistic enterprise and it's for the greatness and the glory of that nation and so forth and it's not that they are not interested in cooperating with other countries but i think there are a lot of people here that, that take some exception as to how that would play out what are your thoughts yeah well i mean first of all i want to say more power to them i think it's a beautiful thing to have uh, uh ambitious competitors right and i have a slide that i show that shows the progress from Sputnik in 1957 to Apollo in 1969. You think about that 13 years, basically. Amazing. A little crappy silver basketball that went beep, beep, beep to a human, <laughs> right. human being standing on the moon in a photo that still kind of iconically represents modernism to us, right? To this day. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks good. Um, and then... We did this uh, handshake in space, 1974, I believe, with Apollo Soyuz, Don't and everybody said, we're going to accomplish so much more together. Well, you know, we were at, uh, what, uh, 250 miles in a 51 degree inclination uh, with a Soyuz capsule. And, you know, 25 years later, we're getting the first components to the space station up there. Uh, and they were in a 51 degree inclination at 250 miles uh, with a Soyuz attached to it. And... Guess what? 25 years after that, we're still at a 51 degree inclination at 250 miles with the Soyuz attached to the thing. It's leaking, but nothing, <laughs> yeah. ha nothing much has happened because competition is much better than cooperation for moving things forward. Anybody that thinks, oh, the UN should form a space program and every country should work together, forget it. The Europeans would take over and they'd regulate it into oblivion and nothing would ever happen. <laughs> competition is beautiful. So bless the Chinese there. Uh, <clears throat> That said, their idea of cooperation broad is pretty much whose uh, who's designs can we steal and copy? Um, you know, they started out with the Russians, but they're they're happy to to take SpaceX designs and just literally present them as their ideas uh, in press conferences. Uh, and you can tell they just took the 3D model rendering uh, from some public website of the Falcon 9 and copied it, or they take the Dragon capsule and they add the windows from uh, from the Blue Orange and New Blue Shepard Origin, capsule because yeah. those windows are cool. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so I, I don't think they're going to have the innovation because unfortunately it's not about China, which, which is a great culture and I love. It's about the Chinese Communist Party, which right. kind of 
beats the creative thinking and disruption out of people uh, along the way because it doesn't want any creative thinking or disruption. Um, so, well, so this brings me to my next question, which is watching the United States all these 66 years I've been alive, it seems that as much as we talk a different game, we really do the best when we have somebody to push against. I mean, we did amazing things. You pointed out during the space race when we, the Soviet Union was our arch enemy, even though we had some back channel discussion about, hey, let's do this together. And they said, yet. But, you know, we've watched the decades with the shuttle, which was a magnificent spacecraft in its way, but it was a slow evolution. Now with, I mean, we just saw it a few couple of years ago and we've seen it again a few months ago. You know, the NASA administrator is using China as a lever to move amounts of money around the federal government and NASA. Uh, do, do we need that? We do. We absolutely do. And I can tell you uh, that the NASA budget was pretty well nominally flat for when George H.W. Bush left office and the peace dividend descended in 92, right, until 2016 when our team sat down. And as you may know, you know, uh, President Trump was fairly reactive if you said China, 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 right? Uh, so, you know, <laughs> yes. pe people said China, China, China. And uh, do you want the best space program in the world, Mr. Trump? Or do you want to be second to the Chinese? And the answer is clear, right? And so there's no difference here with uh, uh, the Democrats. They're, they're, they're doing the same thing. And, and it's good. It's good to have that competition. Would you watch the Olympics, Rod, if... Uh, if the goal of the Olympic Games was that all the teams worked together to cross the finish line at the same time? <laughs> I probably no. I don't watch it much either way, but I, I take your point. I would, like I would, I would take my playing I, for the same goalpost. Right? I, I, okay, I would the take Super my, my medal of participation, though. I would, <laughs> I would treasure it. So. Everyone gets a trophy. <laughs> Were you one of those soccer kids, Tark, that got a participation trophy? Oh, I have like a whole shelf full of like participation this and that right so, and i treasure when them all Greg because, and i were kids if you if, if your team lost they just came around smacked you in the back of the head and said loser yeah you, you, no you didn't even get the pizza party right they just left you out in the rain standing on the curb all yeah. right Tarek, you've got the next question well you know i wanted to ask about uh, kind of building off of this competition versus cooperation for the future of the industry so we've got you know we've got the the un has the peaceful uses of outer space. You know, it's been around since 67 and updated every now and then. Uh, we have the Artemis Accords with NASA recruiting all of these um, these different countries to agree on, I guess, how they're going to use space on the moon. Uh, and on the other side of that, you've got Russia and China, you know, with their own partnership uh, for the future. Oh, I, I, I want Russia and China to add North Korea and Iran so they can have the dream team there. <laughs> well, that's, that's, you know, my, my question is, is, is really... You know, what's what's is is that enough? I mean, is it all just kind of smoke? Because it really from my perspective, like all of these plans and these handshakes and these agreements are, are nice. You know, it's nice that people are thinking about that. But whoever gets there first is going to set the rules for whoever's on the on the moon. Right. And 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 there's there could be not in my backyard as soon as someone sets up the first base there. And and I'm, I'm wondering how much of this is going to actually be realized into you know, actual tangible exploration or or resource utilization and how much of it is just going to evaporate as soon as, you know, one country actually lands there and starts doing stuff. There, yeah, I think Eleanor Roosevelt said the future belongs to those who show up. Um, and yeah, the, the people that are there are the ones that are going to make the rules. And unless there's somebody else able to tell them different or their robots different, um, you know, that's what's going to happen. And I, I've tried to have this talk with folks because the Outer Space Treaty was written in a time when there was, you know, generally a kind of global socialist thinking about things. And so it doesn't effectively address resources. If anything, it might imply that uh, that you can't have private resources. Uh, it clearly bans sovereignty on celestial objects. And if there is no sovereignty, then who actually makes the rules and detailed regulations for managing those resources? Again, as I mentioned, forget the UN. Uh, it, it is a master at, at getting nothing done in any timely manner and making things so complex. And it has no enforcing capabilities. We're not sending any white helmets to the moon, Tariq. So I fear that the Outer Space Treaty is leading us to the Wild West. Uh, and we need to think about that seriously. If you look at... Um, Deadwood. You guys familiar with the story of Deadwood, yeah. right? So the U.S. had a treaty. Nobody is going to mess with the Black Hills, right? We, we signed this treaty with the Sioux Indians, and we agreed that this would be theirs until uh, 
uh, you know, the sun never rose uh, and nobody was allowed to mess with it. But the people who went there and discovered that there was gold messed with it, right? And and they violated that treaty. They fought with uh, with the Native Americans, unfortunately, and abused the environment. They fought with each other. They fought with the U.S. government when uh, the government tried to stop them. And, and that's what happens if you don't have sovereignty and rule of law. So uh, honestly, you, you need a space force that is interested in managing the commercial environment to make sure that people behave the rules. And you need to be clear about who is allowed to write and uh, implement the rules. And, and right now we're in a very ambiguous territory. And Someday there's going to be somebody who says, I don't report to any government on Earth. Uh, and good luck. So I assume you saw uh, at least the first two seasons of For All Mankind. Did you watch that show? I love that show, Ron. And I've got yeah. to give kudos to Garrett Reisman, who uh, is the technical advisor on that, a former NASA astronaut and SpaceX uh, executive. And he's a professor at USC. Uh, uh, I helped to introduce him over there. Right. We're all and, connected and, to and Ron Moore, who was on track yeah. when I was there, although I never worked with him. But um, so, you know, we see a certain kind of future play out there. And I think, you know, one thing that that we would all like would be particularly talking about the Lunar South Pole, for example. We've got an article coming up in the next Ad Astra about that that I'm trying to figure out a good title for right now. <laughs> That's the one I got from the writer I can't use. But um, <laughs> it's clever. <laughs> It involves some allusion to pole dancing, and I'm not sure we can do that. But um, <laughs> I, I tried in one of my books to write a chapter entitled "China Wants to Play Hide the Submarine with Us." And the publisher didn't like that. <laughs> well, so, so you know what we want is the analogy that Rick Tumlinson likes to use, and I think he appropriated it from from others probably as well. Which is, look, we don't want to own the ocean; we just want to be able to keep the fish we catch, right? So you're at the South Pole. Let's say the Chinese get the, get there first. Uh, in, in some capacity, uh, either a heavy robotic presence with a laboratory and process of facility or people, which isn't isn't beyond the imagination. Um, you know, how does that play out in a way where we can get some kind of a win win for two or three different parties trying to occupy this same very large area? I, 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 pol I politely disagree with Rick, who I greatly respect. But when it comes to mining, uh, you need to have a, a clear uh, demarcation of the mineral resources. You may only lease them or, uh, you know, have them under some claim uh, that's part of the government uh, sovereignty. But if nobody owns anything and no government's in charge of jurisdiction, um, you can't just come in and grab a module and leave. Um, and very often you're going to have to work a site and have a refinery of some sort next mm -hmm. to that to smelt metals or separate, uh, you know, oxygen, hydrogen from water ice or clean it. Uh, and these facilities need to not only be protected, uh, but they also need to be something that I can own and get a loan against. Right. So debt financing is so important to industries and the space industry has just been all about equity. Right. You've got to give up a share of your company in the real world. If you have a mine and a smelting operation, you can get loans against these things. Uh, they're collateralizable. Uh, and, and when you buy new equipment uh, and you put it in place, the bank feels that it's safe and uh, and they could repossess it and they'll give you money. And we've got to get to that point. And so that that sort of work is is still left to be ironed out. The U.S. government is working in the right direction, in my opinion, on these things. Uh, but uh, eventually we'll have to have some international agreement that works out. You know, looking to that that future, Greg, you know, we've been talking a lot about new space and I'm putting air quotes around new space because mm -hmm. it's, it's it's been an evolution over the last uh, couple of decades. And I'm wondering what the next step is, like what's after new space? You know, is it is it <laughs> is new space, old space and there's like Uber space or or like what types of things space. Yeah, should space today's, 3 today's yeah. either new new folks that are in in the industry? Uh, what should they be looking like ahead? Uh, you know, in the next 20 years uh, for how, how the industry is going to be working at that time and how to navigate it there. Yeah, I mean, I think the important lesson is they need to understand this this geopolitical and policy environment as they watch it unfold. I think the data, like I mentioned, in the communications uh, are going to be the picks and shovels of, of this industry and uh, getting power to the dark side of the moon. Uh, these are interesting things uh, that that they should all be uh, be looking at, um, but we all need to be working together to, to find a solution where we can exploit these resources for the benefit of, of humankind, but make sure that it actually does benefit humankind. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a, 
an interesting uh, a space 3.0 or whatever you want to call it to watch, but it'll be it'll be this amalgam of government space, military space, traditional space companies, and 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 the new space startups uh, uh, competing, working together, conflicting at times. Uh, an exciting place to be. Space 3.0, Rod. That's your that's yeah, your next know, book well, after after 2.0. Right? I, I am <laughs> still trying to get the publisher to let me write an update of the one I've got because it's four years out of date. But uh, I'm going to make this prediction. I think Space 2, uh, 3.0 will emerge before Web 3.0, which doesn't really exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so my last thought here is, you know, say you're talking to groups of uh, high school or junior high school kids, and they're saying, Dr. Autry, you know, what if, if, as I used to hear from my son as he was growing up, because he was a little more money oriented than I am, you know, what should I, what part of new space should I get into if I want to make a lot of money and have a cool job? I like power, um, hmm. nuclear power systems, both for surface operations and in space, a space solar power, uh, and not just beaming it back to Earth like uh, our friends at NSS always want to sell you on, but beaming it uh, to other locations in space, to the dark side of the moon. Uh, there is uh, no dark side of the moon. Yeah. <laughs> there is. There's, no, 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 no. Every 16 days, every part of the moon is dark. Uh, okay, that's what right. it's, Yeah, I do not good mean point. the backside when I say the dark side. I mean literally the dark side. The dark. Okay, good, good. Uh, but yeah, data, power, uh, in infrastructure, uh, be the utility company of space. That is smart. See, Tark, I told you. Yeah. He's a yeah. smart, smart guy. All right. Well, Greg, I want to thank you for joining us today. Talk about the future new space and how you can grab your piece of it, young people. So I hope you listened up. Uh, where's the best place, uh, Greg, where we can keep up with your latest adventures online? Uh, well, you can find me on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter at Greg W. Autry. I want to be really careful about the W. There's another gentleman named Greg Autry there who looks just like me, but he's an erotic photographer, and uh, that's not fellow. me. <laughs> that's caused me a world of hurt when I try to explain things to background check people. <laughs> the middle initial is always key, as I can attest as well. The J in Tara J. Malik is always very important because there's a lot of Tarek Maliks out there. So. There's only about three other people in the world with my name, so I have it pretty easy. Tarek, where do we well, find you? Pole pile. Pole yeah. pile. There you go. Pole dancer pile. Well, uh, as always, you can find me on uh, on space.com uh, uh, trying to find out what the next big thing is. Uh, getting ready for Crew 6 with SpaceX. We're going to have a whole team uh, down at the launch site at the end of the month. And uh, and you can find me on the Twitters at Tarek J. Malik. And uh, as of February 24th, probably on my laptop playing Kerbal Space Program 2. I got a sneak peek last week at it, and Rod, <laughs> Rod is making faces. It's a lot of fun, and I'll have a whole big piece on it next week. So please uh, uh, please check that out. Thanks. Well, awesome. I, I feel an episode coming on Kerbal. All right. Well, and it's very <laughs> cool. And, of course, you can always uh, track me down at pilebooks.com or at astromagazine.com, our wonderful national space society magazine by the way i forgot to mention greg you are still the vice president of space development for the national space society indeed i'm not sure what that means but there you go it's a we'll talk a, about that some other time right? laudable title um and occasionally i'm on instagram and other places and please don't forget to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv that's t-w-i-s at twit.tv we always welcome your comments suggestions ideas and we answer every single email because we love you that much. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe and tell your friends. Give us reviews, five stars, thumbs up, five chocolate chip cookies, whatever it is. Any of them will do nicely. And you can always head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. Also, don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free on Club Twit, as well as some extras that are only available there. For just $7 a month, no blue check marks required. And you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. Thanks so much. We will see you next time. If you love all things Android, well, I've got a show for you to check out. It's called All About Android, and I'll give you three guesses what we talk about. We talk about Android, the latest news, hardware, apps. We answer feedback. It's me, Jason Howell, Ron Richards, Win Twit Dow, and a whole cast of awesome characters talking about the operating system that we love. You can find All About Android at twit.tv slash AAA.